This is someone who has had an amazing impact on, on my career. I, I started learning about uh, trading from this person. And it's, of course, uh, Dr. Eric Wish of the University of Maryland, who I first took his class. Uh, I didn't know anything about stocks. And um, he was my introduction and really inspired me to get serious about this and learn an incredible amount of about this. And, you know, in his curriculum, he spends a lot of time uh, focusing on the historic traders, uh, we we read chapters from Minervini, David Ryan, uh, and it was just an amazing learning experience and really started me on my way and hopefully saved me time in my journey. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have him here. And I'll go ahead and invite Dr. Wish up. And uh, we'll be able to run through a presentation that he's got prepared. So Dr. Wish, welcome. Great to have you. Hello, um, Richard and John. It's real pleasure and an honor to be here and to join this great group of students. Um, it, it's just amazing that it was only, what, four years ago that you took my course, were a prize student, and what you've done with that knowledge and gone on to um, interview the great traders of our time and to educate people. I'm, I'm really in awe of what you've done. Um, as for me, everyone, um, I'm a, I am more of a part-time investor or trader. It's nice that um, I've had a job where, where I could earn you know, a stable salary as a professor and as a research psychologist. And um, I've been doing this for almost 60 years now. And it was, I couldn't have learned that part-time without taking advantage of what a lot of these uh, people have written that John talked about. Um, when I listened to this today, um, I wasn't prepared for all the memories that it brought back because I was just getting started in the mid 60s and then the 70s. And I wanted to just share with you, I used to show this chart from the Wall Street Journal. They used to have back then a, um, a chart of the major market averages. And um, I'll never forget at the bottom of it was the herd on the street column where they would tell you what the market was going to do and what they thought. And I'll never forget that in May 1970, at the very, well, let me just say, in May 1970, they wrote, if there's anything we're sure of, the market is, is, is has got more to fall. And that marked the last day of the bottom. That was the bottom of the market. So it taught me that the, the greats, the media and whatever, you know, you sort of, you sort of shouldn't listen to them. Uh, they'll take you off your game and they'll be wrong. You know, you have to let the market tell you what you what you, what um, you can do. So, as I say, I've been doing it for, for many times. I've um, I've made every mistake you can make. And I wanted to mention John mentioned Taser. I remember owning Taser and having a huge profit in it. And then um, I went to a, a meeting, a research meeting on my career, career area. And um when I came out of that meeting, I lost, I had lost $28,000 of profits. And so what that taught me was not to go to any meetings in Baltimore. No, not really. What, <laughs> taught, what it taught me was you better put a, a stop loss in because you can look at all these model stocks and all the things we've been talking about. And those are showing us where the setups have worked. But as every great trader has said, and, and you know, O'Neill said it, Minavini says it, Ryan, everyone, you know, they're lucky to be right half the time. So you've got to know when these setups aren't going to work. And one of the biggest ways is looking at the market, as we've been saying all day here. Um, you've got to know what the market is. So so um, I kept out of the market declines in 2000, 2008, 2020, and in 2022. And I was really upset during the declines when I would listen to the media and they would tell people to hold, to stay in, you can't time the market. I guess the people who say they can't time the market just don't know how to do it. So what I decided to do is I started teaching young people what I wish I had known at their age. Boy, I think John, would you agree? If you knew all this when you were in your 20s, wow, your life, your financial life may have been very different. And I started a blog where I share with people what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, when I opened my account in the 60s at Merrill Lynch, I remember they gave me this book. I believe it was How to Buy Stocks by Lewis Engel. And it was basically, you know, you're buying a piece of America and you buy and you hold. And I remember 
I, I thought I was so smart. I was in college at the time and I went and I bought a stock with a very low price earnings ratio. And I thought, gee, this must be great because it's a low PE. Anyway, you know, you know how that works out. So it wasn't until I happened to read Davis's book that it's turned me around from buying stocks at its lows to buying stocks at their highs. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. But I read Davis. And then I read O'Neill's book and started reading Investors Daily, I think it was called at the time, around 85. And that's when I started to make money. Because one of the things that IBD does, and MarketSmith still does, is it takes your, your companies where you're trying to compare them for earnings and, and how well they're doing, their fundamentals, and, and how their prices are doing with the technicals. And it puts it on a percentile scale. How great is that? So you buy stocks that are in the 90th percentile or 95th percentile, as David Ryan says. And that's that, you know, that turned me around and that helped me to start making money. And I've been able to protect my university retirement, my IRA, where I do most of my trading. And I've, you know, my IRA is, is up over the time, over 20 times. And it's like a separate, separate retirement uh, money for me. But also I've been able to pull my, my, um, my, um, pension money out of mutual funds um, during these declines. I'll never forget pulling my um, TIAA craft growth fund out at around 103 in 2000. And six months or a year later, that same mutual fund was trading at 36. Can you imagine having your, your future and your pension money go from 103 to 36? Well, that's what was happening to people back then. And that's when they were saying, stay in the market. So basically, that's when I started teaching this. And you can time the market. And I'm going to show you how I do it. And I know there are multiple ways to do it. The, the market pulse in IBD is fantastic. Um, I've taken what I've learned about the market. Look, I'm a scientist. I have to create. So I've taken, I've looked at things and I've created my own rules, and I'll, I'll share them a little bit with you. And what I thought I would do today is show you some slides that um, I would show in my class. Um, this is, um, Barron's used to run a, a contest for business professors and their students. And back in 2005, I entered, even though I wasn't teaching back then, and um, I entered and you can see I came in in the professor's division, I came in fifth in the country, so I use that to go back to the university people where I had been teaching an honors course on drugs in American society and said, I have the second passion. I'd love to teach a course on this. I said, write it up. I wrote it up. And I've been teaching now since 2006, first an honors class where Richard went and now a larger class for, for our freshmen. So um, next slide, Richard. I've been written up. This is when Investors.com wrote me up in the Real People, Real Success column. I've also done a lot of public speaking at AAII and a variety of other locations. Keep going. And um, if you are really interested and you want to get something that will help you to sleep at night, you can get this interview done with me by uh, Les Mayenson, um, who was great. He did a 10-page interview with me in technical analysis of stocks and commodities. If you can get ahead, get a hold of that November 2019 issue, it'll tell you more about my history, how I got involved in this, um, and why I start teaching. And it also shows some of the technical things I teach. Next. So first of all, I got to tell you, just like everyone else, this is just for educational reasons. My late co-instructor who Richard worked with very closely, David McCandlish, built the slide. I loved him. He he, he did most of my um, my IT for me because I'm an IT dummy. And um, he created this. This, of course, is the decline in Enron. And basically all we're saying is um, I'm going to talk to you about a lot of things. And the idea, and I tell my class this, don't believe anything I say. Go and test it on your stocks. Test it on the market. Take what works for you and whatever doesn't work for you, just ignore. Next slide. So this is the mantra for my course. It takes 14 weeks to teach students what this means. Every word. In an uptrending market, buy visionary rocket stocks that are bouncing off of support or that are oversold or that are breaking through resistance on above average volume. As I say, it takes 14 weeks for kids to learn this, but boy, 
when they um, come out of my class, they can run the software that I use. They can analyze stocks. And some of them have gone on to start hedge funds. One of them, Richard, went on to educate people. And it has helped people to change their careers because um, some people, for instance, who were going to medical school decided they were going to look at medical stocks. Go ahead, next. So these are, are on my blog. And these are the books that made the biggest difference to me over my lifetime. As you know, you know, Mark Grinovini will say he has like 4,000 books, but there are only a handful that made a difference to him. These are the ones that, that, um, that I have. And John, I apologize. I don't have your latest book on it, but this is something I did a long time ago and I haven't changed it. But the first book there is by Alan Elman. It's the Stock Investing for Students. And it's a great, great book to just explain to people fundamentals, the whole language of investing and, and technical analysis. And then there's Davis's book, How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market. And then of course, his second book, Wall Street, The Other Las Vegas, which um, you probably know that his book was such a hit. The first book was such a hit that the American Stock Exchange stopped um, allowing people to use stop loss orders. Because what happened is, is as people learned about stop loss orders, you'd have all these orders in to sell at a certain price and it would cause an avalanche of selling. So um, the New York Stock Exchange, however, allowed stop loss orders throughout the time. And when um, when Davis came out with a second book, Wall Street, the La other Las Vegas, and showed a, a organizational chart comparing the stock brokers ver and the, the, uh, the um, stock exchange versus the casinos in Las Vegas, um, the people like Barron's wouldn't hold that, would not publish ads, even though his book put Barron's on the map, because as you know, Davis was studying Barron's um, uh, when he was dancing around the world. Uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, I just tell all the students to read it in the summer. It is a phenomenal book about Jesse Livermore. Um, the other books, are the first book I have them read, it's required is How I Made $2 Million, because as John Blake was saying, you learn, you go, you go hand in hand with Davis and learn all the mistakes he made as he tried to teach himself how to make money. Then um, in addition to that, they read some of Stan Weinstein's book, which is a very important um, book about stage analysis. And if you can, I urge you to go and see Richard, Richard um, Moglin and Stan did a beautiful course on stage analysis. And um, you really should, you really should, should do that. Um, the third book, which is the Bible of the course, is, of course, William O'Neill's How to Make Money in Stocks. Um, it's it's phenomenal, and it helped it helped me. The things that we were learning in this course currently with John, you know, that's what the students learn. They read they read um, O'Neill's words, and they look it over the charts that he's, that he's has in the book. The book has a lot of charts, as you know, and then of course. Uh, Mark Menavini, who actually came to my class and gave everyone a free copy of his book, he's really, um, really is is passionate about the fact that I'm teaching this course, which is probably the only course in the United States for undergraduates on technical analysis in the stock market. And um, I call him the modern day Nicholas Davis. Um, I think that's all I'm going to talk about now. If you get a chance, read The Complete Turtle Trader by Michael Carvel. The, turtle, the turtles are a famous group of traders who they taught them how to use their system, which is a very technical based system for trading commodities. And the book is very, very interesting and worthwhile reading. Next slide. So I know John likes this book. He mentioned it. I love this quote. There are no ma There's no magic about buy signals. They are only devices by which we call our attention to stocks that have already begun to attract the attention of others. Look at what Davis did. Look at what O'Neill did. They look for stocks going up on huge volume. The volume showed that the big guys, the people with a lot of money, were buying them. You don't want to be a pioneer in the stock market. You want to find something that is already picking up, moving up, is off the launch pad. Go ahead, next. So I like to show the students this. Because this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1929 to 1956. And I just want to show you, um, um, Richard, can you print out, point out the green line right there? You see that? That's the peak of the Dow 
And you know how people say, oh, the market always comes back? Yeah, it does. But it took 25 years of that time. Okay. And what I wanted to, 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 to drive home is that when Davis made his fortune, it was when the market was moving to all time highs. And in the Trader Lion presentation I did for 2022, I went back and showed you that when Mark Menavini did great in the Investors Championship, the two times he did it, the, the indexes were hitting a series of all time highs. It's easy. I'm not, uh, by the way, Mark beat everyone. I'm not taking anything away from him. He beat everyone. They were all trading at the same time. But what I'm saying, the huge gains tend to occur when the indexes are going to all time highs. Next slide. So this is in the back of, of the Davis's book. There were questions and answers after the first edition. And they someone asked him, when you use a historical high as a buy point, do you hold literally to the historical high? Or can you buy safe the stock making a new high for a lesser period, say five years, that also shows stepped up volume? And his answer was, I strictly adhere to historical high. If you go back, even John, if you go back to your chart of Chrysler and draw in the green, what I call a green line at the peak that it early reached earlier and draw that, you will see the big people got in when it broke out to an all-time high. And that is what O'Neill did in the in the in my analysis for the um the trade line 2022 presentation. I drew in all what I call the green line peaks. That is when O'Neill was buying. So when people look at cup and handles or bases in a stock that's way down from its all-time high, I don't think they're doing what O'Neill did or what Davis did. You really want to own the stocks that are breaking out to all-time highs. And that's what I talk about in my blog. I'm totally I'm continually showing the stocks that are the first to break out to all time mm -hmm. highs. Those are the winners. Next slide. I want to bring your attention to um, John Kokoroba's um, presentation that he did. He did a three volume, three webinar presentation on Jesse Libanor, and it was a perfect complement to what John Boyd did. And if you can, reach out to John and see if he'll make this available to you. I had read reminiscences. I had read some other books on Jesse, but I'm telling you, I learned so much about Jesse Livermore. One of the things that I remember that he said, um, there's in 29, remember how he's, we talk about he made $100 million by going short? What is not so clear that comes out in this presentation is before he made that, he lost $6 million trying to short the market. He was shorting too early. And where Bernard Baruch was shorting and making a fortune in 29, he talks about how many times he tried shorting and he was wrong. And when I read that, that gave me permission to be wrong, to, to try something. And if I'm wrong, fine. Uh, my timing was off. All right. If I'm right about the market or about the stock or whatever, and I'm wrong about the timing, go back in when the, when the, when the timing changes, when the stock moves up. Next slide. All right. So when I went to a, an AAII presentation in Virginia, which I don't go to that often to, to Virginia, um, I remember that I used to have to, in the good old days, used to get a map out and used to draw, go left here, go right here, go this, go that. And then you had MapQuest that would print out the directions. And now you have GPS and I use Waze. And I basically said to them, buying a stock without checking its chart is like dri driving to a new place without ways. You can eventually get there, but it is so much harder. And I know William O'Neill said it's like a doctor not using the x-rays or whatever. So bottom line, you have to learn to use charts. And I'm amazed at how many people I talk to, especially people um, near my age near retirement when they, they're in the market and they never looked at a stock chart. All right, next slide. So I want to show you some simple ways that I have found that work for me. And you need to try them out if you want to. I invite you to. Of course, this is Stan Weinstein stage analysis. He did it with the 30-week moving average. You can see that. Richard, can you print to it? Point. There's the 30-week moving average, and there's the stock closing in a stage two above the 30-week average. They're both rising together. And basically, Stan was saying, that's when you own stocks. Well, you know what? That's also when you want to be in the market, when it's in a stage two, not when, certainly not when it's in a stage four or even when it's in a stage one. You want the thing to be moving up. Next slide. So I created 
this um, recently in the last few years. I, I talked about this in the 2022 Trader Line presentation. You know, there's something magical about the 30 week. Now, I know that Stan now uses the 40 week, which you could say is like the 200 day moving average. I stuck with the original 30 week, which you may say is equivalent to 150 day moving average, but it really isn't because a 30 week moving average averages 30 data points, say 30 Friday closes, whereas 150 day moving average averages 150 data points. And to the extent that those data points differ from the weekly close, you can get different numbers. Anyway, I like the 30 moving average, 30 week also, because it turns quicker than a 40 week moving average. You know, the shorter the moving average, the quicker it turns. So look, the blue dot here, point to it, Richard, please, is the is the 10 week moving average, which is, you know, for most of what O'Neill says, he doesn't like to hold the stock when it closes below the 10 week, especially on, on volume, big volume. Look at the gray line there. That is the weekly close. This is, by the way, the QQQ. So notice, this is 1999 to 2000. You are in a period where you're in a stage two, where the market is primary, is always above the red line, the 30-week, and the 10-week is rising above the 30-week. And when do you start to get danger signals? When the market closes below the red line, that is a danger signal of weakening. And then especially when the 10-week closes below the 30-week, that's a bigger sign of weakening. And then I got out of the market in 2000 in October when the 30-week moving average curved down. If all you do is get out when the moving average, that 30-week is curving down, and get in when it's curving up, you're going you're gonna to save yourself a lot of heartache. So I got back in, I'm not showing it, in 03, when the 30-week moving average started up, and my account was up 53% that year. Next slide. So here's our current time. During the 2021 bull market, same pattern. 10-week above the 30, your market is primarily closing above the 10-week. Then all of a sudden, you started to get closes below the 30-week average, right? And then the 10-week closed below the 30. Now you got your bear market. And then what happened? The 10-week closes above the 30. The market closes. The market starts closing above the, the, the 30-week. And now you're in a stage two. So it's, it's okay to buy stocks again, okay? Believe me, this works. Go back over history and take a look, and you will see how great an indicator this is. All right, next slide. But it works for stocks too. Here's Peloton during the upswing. Look at that nice stage two analysis. The 10 week is above the 30, fine to own it. Then the 10 week closes below it. The 30 week curves down. Now you get out of it. I just, you know, I put on my blog when some, when, some, when these stocks fall like this and I say, how can you stay in a stock that's, that's got a stage four decline where it's below the 30 week average that's declining. Don't do it. Next stop. This is just another example. Here's Zoom, phenomenal stock in a stage two uptrend. Same pattern. Okay, next slide. I had to show you Kathy, Kathy Wood's ARC ETF. Same thing. You own it when it's in a stage two. The 10 week is rising above the 30. That stops, you get out. Next slide. All right. I just wanted to show you NVIDIA, which again was in a stage two, most of 20 and 21. The 10 week for the most part is above the 30. Then that changed. The, the stock declined in the in the bear market. And now you're back into a stage two. OK, next slide. All right. Um, I designed after doing this for many years, I designed my general market index. Wishing Wealth is the name of my site. And I plot this, um, I show a table like this every weekend, I plot it. And it, there are six, forget the GMI too, that's just some very quick indicators, sensitive indicators that I just, it just forces me to do this every night. But, you know, I'm looking at like the first thing was wishing wealth was a 10 day successful new high index, you know? And all that was based on what Dava said. He said, look, if I'm buying stocks at new highs, and they stop performing, that's a sign that the market's weakening. So this just looks at all the stocks that hit a new high 10, 10 days ago, and are they higher today than they were 10 days ago? And then I want at least 100 new highs in the market, because if I'm going to buy stocks at new highs, I want to see a lot of new highs. Um, 
I want, um, I then have something where I look at the Qs and the SPY for daily index. And then I have a weekly index on the Qs. And then I noticed that IBD has this mutual fund index that they they publish, um, you know, every time, every day. And basically the sign for that, if you want a symbol and you go to MarketSmith or IBD, it's zero M-U-T-I. And you can pull up this chart and you can see the 50-day average. And I noticed that if these mutual funds couldn't hold above the 50-day average, this is a sign of weakness in the market, okay? And then I wanna just show you at the bottom, uh, I have a, a short-term trend count that I do every day, That's the, and it's U58. We're now in U65 or something. You point to that, um, Richard, right, right there. And I, I, I list that every day on my blog. And then at the bottom, I added this recently, started it since I started the 10, 10, 30 week. You see the number of weeks, the QQQ 10 week is above its 30 week. It was, it, it was 21 weeks. It's now 23 weeks. Okay, next, next, um, David, uh, Richard, next. Um, this is an example of my blog. I just wanted to point out that you can see the GMI. Richard, can you point to the GMI figure right there? And you can also see over on the right that the current signal is green. I'll explain that in a minute. It's green since March 30th, 2023. And then a lower down, you can see you can sign up if you want to get this free blog sent to your email box. Okay, next slide. So this looks at, I created an indicator, the GMI, and basically, actually one of my students, one of students went to the London School of Economics and was looking at this and came up with this rule. And basically, you see the rule at the bottom. Can you point to it, Richard? If the GMI is above three for two consecutive days, it's green. Until it turns, until it turns red if it's below three for two consecutive days. So this shows you the QQQ when it was on a red or green signal. And so you can see, you can study this later when you look at the slides. I just apologize. It's 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 hard to read, but you can see how it helped me to be on the right side of the market and out of the market when it was red. I think the next slide is a little little shorter. You can see this, what it was doing. You can see how it's been green since mid-March. And it gets me out quicker, but it gets me in later. All right. Next slide. I wanted to just remind this to show you that on this was done on November 22nd. And I wrote that I, re this is, remember, November 22nd, 2021, be 2021, before the bear market. And I wrote that I regret that I changed the word scared to concern in yesterday's post when I characterized my current take on the market with 438 new lows and 232 new highs registered Monday. Um, I am very concerned and scared about the market near term. And John, I appreciate you. I have been seeing your tweets talking about the new high, new low, and it got me sensitive. I track the number of new highs and new lows every day when the market closes. And here we had an index that was hitting new highs. The market was hitting new highs. And all of a sudden we started hitting 438 new lows. That told me something about the internals of the market. And I said, I've been reviewing the perspective writings of Marty Swag, whom I, uh, Martin Swag, I, as I, recommend you read his book, Winning on Wall Street, and Ned Davis. And I'm struck by their urgent advice to fight the Federal Reserve's intentions. When the Fed moves to the raise rates, the stock market and even the economy gets a cold or worse. Higher rates suck money out of stocks because people can earn a decent return, can earn a decent return in interest type in instruments rather than from risky stocks. With inflation zooming, does anyone think rates will not go higher? Now that Powell has learned he will keep his job, he can start raising short rates. So I wrote this in November 21, and I pulled my money, a substantial amount of money, in my university pensions, my 403B and my 457. I went into money market. And I'll tell you, I saved myself a lot of money because most of the people know that most of the mutual funds over the next year fell 19 to 20%. And 20% of all my money was a lot of money. Next slide. So I've been thinking, you know, I was going to start my course again on September 1st. And I, I've been doing a lot of this reading and thinking I'm always innovating and saying, if I could boil it down to a setup, 
what what would that be? What what's the criteria of a good setup? Because when you read these people that John Boyk's been talking, I think they're all basically doing. First of all, they indicate a precise buy or sell point. It's a some people call it a pivot, a breakout point, or whatever. There needs to be a precise buy or sell point, and then you have to think that the desired move is imminent. In other words, if I buy here, I expect the market to the stock to move up. And that way, it provides a clear way to determine when you failed, because you have to know quickly when you fail, because a lot of these setups fail. All right. And this enables you to, to set a stop loss that minimizes loss, because the biggest, you know, I think um, Richard Dennis, who from the, the famous man from uh, Trader, from the, the uh, turtle trader said, you could almost pick stocks by trial and error as long as you you control your losses to be small when you're wrong. That is what keeps you in the game. And finally, the setup that I like fits my personality and my tolerance of risk. Every person will tinker with it to what they want. I like to buy stocks that have hit all time highs and then become oversold and move up. But other people may wanna just buy the stocks breaking out to new highs. Next slide. All right, I'm not going to read all of this, but the point I want, it took me a long time to learn this. The critical point to remember is the same price pattern or setup that works so well in a rising market is likely to fail in a declining market. And you learn that because it's, it's, it's you know, the market, you know, you, you're looking at the market, you like, to, you like to, to, to have some money in the market and you find a great setup that once worked and it fails because you know why? The market is lousy. Don't do that. Okay, you have to know the market. It's the M and can slim. Next slide. All right, so I'm not gonna go through all of this. Um, you can you can um, study this yourself, but basically it says the market has to be in a stage two. I want the stock to be near an all time high. It has to, um, there has to be a good technical reason to buy it. I don't wanna hold it if there's an imminent earnings release because Earnings, you you can look look at what's happened lately. Look what happened to um, Chipotle with their earnings. It fell, the stock fell, to, what, 200 points. You want strong market smith, fundamental ratings and rankings. So I may go ahead and search and do scans for stocks that meet my setup. The first thing I do is I go to market smith and I say, what's the composite rating? What are the what are the projected earnings for the next quarter? All of these things that O'Neill was talking about and Davis was talking about and Ryan talks about. I want a good reason to buy the stock other than it just looks, has a beautiful chart. I would like to see evidence of increased volume. And I, um, you know, when I started making money in stocks, I had the IBD 50 and I would just look at that newspaper and look at the IBD 50 stocks and that's where the winners were. Now I look at the market Smith growth 250 and the IBD 50. I create a watch list of those stocks and those are the ones I scan on. Next slide. Almost done there. So some other things that I thought about, I just want to share with you. Um, I once held, I think it was, um, I owned 800 shares of, of, um, Yahoo, and it went up 50 points in one week, you know, and that's like $40,000. And I remember it kept going. And then all of a sudden, my little voice said, this is too easy. I sold and I sold near the top. And that little voice has helped me if I own something thinking it's going up and it starts to really zoom, go way beyond I ever thought it could, I'll sometimes sell. Oh, I do sell. It doesn't happen that often because I'm not that that fortunate that often. I like to say every loss brings me to the next game. You have to be willing to take losses when you're wrong. You know, they say, the someone said, the market's never wrong, opinions are wrong. I think Livermore said that. Look, you're going to be wrong more than you're right. And the way to win at this is to have bigger gains and then you have and small losses. You've got to always have small losses. Um, I'm told that William O'Neill, I did go to one of his free visits in, in DC, did get to ask him a question, although I don't remember the question, but um, he, I'm told he used to have a big barrel at the door, at the entrance to his seminars, which said, deposit your ego here. It's not about being right. It's not about being smart. It's about being about making money. And it doesn't mean you're right or smart and get rid of your ego. 
because that'll kill you. I told you to read Martin Swag's book, Don't Ever Fight the Fed. There's a chapter in Market Wizards by, by David Ryan that I, um, that I require the students to read. It is the best, simple, clear set of rules to use the can slim that David wrote. And David was, um, at, you know, has been fantastic um, using the can slim method. I actually met him at the Mark Mini Mini um, um, to do, you know, in um, Myrtle Beach. And the other thing I want you to, I want you to think about a lot of these people are glued to the market every day. And you got to decide, is that the way you want to do it? Davis wasn't glued to the market every day. He got telegrams, yeah, and he got barons on the weekend. But he was he had a career when he made his money, at least his initial money. And you 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 need to decide, are you going to create a setup and a system of, of trading that means you're going to be there every day? Or is it are you going to basically have a job or something else? and use these methods to get in the market, but not have to watch your stocks every minute. I'm kind of amazed when I look at what John showed of William O'Neill's holding a stock for months. Many of his best winners that he did a whole series on, it took six to eight months for these stocks to, to move, to move up and to make that gain. You don't get in and out every minute. At least that's not what they did. And you have to decide, do you want to do that? Because I know Mark Minivini will, and especially in a bad market, he'll get in, get a 10% gain and get out. And, you know, that means you have to be really on top of it. And, um, you know, you have to decide how much of a life you want to give to the market. Um, finally, I want to say you can get more details of the things I've been talking about. I apologize. I talk quick, quickly. And I, I know that I just covered an introduction of things. And I invite you to to come to my blog, to follow my tweets at Wishing Wealth and, and um, you know, teach yourself this. You know, I know it took six years. I think I think it took me a lot more than six years, John, because I wasn't doing it full time. I think I really made my big money in the 90s. Um, I know one year I made more than $200,000 in a year and I made more than I earned as a professor that year. And I've been able to hold on to the money and keep growing it over time. Um, so please, you know, I invite you to go to Trader Line. Next slide is this is how you can follow me um, at wishingwealthblog.com. Everything is free. Um, and um, you can even email me there or you can follow my tweets, which I guess that should be a Z now. Is that right? Um, at, at Wishing Wealth. And uh, Richard, did you add another slide about Trader Line? Yep. Here's a screenshot. There's your first well. presentation. Really, really fantastic. Yeah, thank you for the great opportunity this was to address these great students. And I just hope that they they can learn, learn as we all have. Just learn and keep learning and keep keep protecting yourself from the market. The market is not an easy thing to make money with. And you're going to really have to take advantage of what, what all of these people have learned and what Richard shares um, with, the, with his... Um, with his interviews and what John does in his books, because if you don't have time to read every person individually, John summarizes very nicely what's been learned from these great traders. And um, I hope you, some of you maybe have stayed awake and learned something from what I said today. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having a, uh, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Appreciate it a lot. <clears throat> yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. I highly recommend uh, checking out, uh, those resources mentioned and and Dr. Wish, did you want to touch on a little bit more about you know how history has played a part in in your development and how that saved you time? Well, I don't think I'd be here talking if I hadn't read Darius and O'Neill. I mean, you know, they had it. They they had they. Oh, you're on mute. You you went on mute for a little bit. Are you can you hear me? Yep, you're back. Yeah, I'm basically saying I, I I couldn't have done what I'd done if I if I hadn't read Davis first. I I remember um going into a broker where I had been using and I bought a stock, I think it was Telex, which was a phenomenal stock. Anyway, I bought a stock breaking in a new high and it made a, it went up. And I remember the person who had put the order in for me was kind of surprised that I had bought a stock that gone up. <laughs> and um um 
Oh, um, one other thing I wanted to mention that um, David Ryan has mentioned this and both and Nicholas Stavis have. And I know that John talked about lots of times it looked like um, Davis or even O'Neill was buying a stock late. But I can tell you that David Ryan and Nicholas Davis have said they would like to buy a stock that's already doubled. When I bought Taser, Taser had already gone from three to 21. That's a sevenfold increase. I, use, I show my students this. I bought that because it formed... It was basically a flag, but it, it went from three to 21 and then it went sideways for a number of weeks. All right. And so most people would say I would get out. It's too high and it's already went up sevenfold. And you know what that stock did? It broke out to an all time high and went up sevenfold again. So right. I like to tell the students that you learn in psychology that one of the best and I'm a psychologist, you learn that one of the best predictors of people's future behavior is past behavior. Well, it's the same thing with stocks. You want to get a stock that's going to double, find one that's already doubled. If you go back and look at some of the stocks that John showed you today and look at when William O'Neill got in, the stock had already doubled from its low. So that's a good sign of a, of a, of a powerful stock. Um, let's see if there's anything else. I think, oh, uh, the only other thing I think I might have mentioned is, is get, go to Market Smith's, their Market Pulse, because they're, they're, they do a really great job of, of tracking the, the market and what, whether you should be in it and out of it. I tell students that for many years, you know, you know, when you talk to people, they go and they get the Wall Street Journal. Well, you know what? I don't know of a single time the Wall Street Journal ever told people to get out of the market. And that's what, that's what you know, IBD did from the get-go. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal. So Yeah, that's why he created the newspaper, because yeah. the Wall Street Journal was just a business paper. Right. And now they own it. <laughs> right. That's correct. Yeah. You know, but um, <clears throat> no, I, I still, um, it's, so I, I've read, you know, a, a voraciously about the market. And, you know, John has written about most of the, most of these people. I've read them over my lifetime. And I go back and I read Davros every, every once in a while, I go back and read it because it means something different to me every time I read it. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, um, the same thing with O'Neill. And, and um, I do, I do think David Ryan said something um, on the 2022 presentation just before me. He said, it's, you don't have to focus on the type of base. You don't have to focus on the cup and handle and all these other, you know, double bottom and all that. He says, the important thing is, basically, you got a stock that moved up and rested. I'm just putting it in my words. He said it formed the base and then it moves out of that base. That's what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, and that's what they all do. Mm -hmm. And especially this thing about the all-time high, I think that's critical because I think a lot of people forget that, especially when you have so many, um, so many um, winners that are way down. I mean, if you bought markets, um, if you bought, I, I can't show you the chart, but I mean, it, when Microsoft hit an all-time peak, it waited ten years, ten years about before it hit a new all-time high. That's when you buy it. Mm -hmm. All the people who bought it higher and have it fall are, are just itching to get out and to sell. That's tremendous selling pressure. But boy, if that stock can go through all that selling pressure and go to an all time high, that's what I want to buy. And when I, when I do presentations, like certainly to AAII, I'll, 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 um, I'll start off by saying, how many people here will buy a stock at a new yearly high? And maybe out of a hundred people, I maybe get five or 10. And then I said, how about stocks are at all time highs and maybe you get one. And I say, that's all I buy. I said, why? If you want a stock that can go to the moon, why don't you want one that's climbing higher towards the moon rather than one that's falling back to the earth and one that's just going flat? You know, it used to, remember there used to be that statement, it takes a rocket scientist, it does. Stocks are like rockets. You don't want to get them on the launch pad. You want to get them after they've taken off and they're moving higher and higher, as long as you control your losses. 
I don't know what else I can say about history other, you know, other than everyone should do it and, and, and um, take the time to learn this. And oh, one other thing I tell my students now, when Davis traded, do you remember? It might cost them 60 to to $100 just to get in, get in a trade or get in and out. So he was down 100 bucks just for getting out. Nowadays, it's commission free. So if you're trying to learn how to do this and you're trying to test, test out setups and everything, buy, a, buy one share. If you can't do it when you, one share, you're not going to do it with 100 shares. You know, just learn how to do this and learn how to control your losses. That's the name of the game. And uh, yep. <laughs> just to point out, in the stock contest that's part of your class, you have us analyze each of the losses that we took that are above a certain amount. And I think that's a really tremendous exercise. And, and Darvis did, did that in his book as well. And he talks about buying to extend it, all that. And that, that I found out that was an issue that I was doing right there and there. So that's a, it's a tremendous exercise. And Liv Man did it and, and Ryan did it and O'Neill did it. You know, it's like, um, take that table in Davis's book, the loss analysis table and require yourself to do it every loss you have analyze what did you do wrong i mean i i you know i've done that and boy you know the nicest thing is when you find something you're doing consistently wrong because then all you got to do is change that and then you do well you do better mm -hmm. and so the students in my class i told you that i did the barons stock uh, challenge well i use that same um software all the students buy a $100,000 margin account. It's all virtual, funny money. And they're all required to trade that. Once they've learned, they generally read, used to be a thousand pages. Now they leave, learn, they read about a 500 pages about all of this history. And then they learn about setups and then they learn what setup they're going to apply. And then their job is to apply it over like a seven or eight week period. With that hundred thousand dollars, they can't buy cheap stocks, and um, they can't buy ETFs, and they basically get to learn how it works, and they study their losses. And I tell all these students that look, not everyone is going to be a Richard Moglin or Eric Wish or a, a bunch of our John Boy. Not everyone's going to really want to pursue this and be able to make money, right? But if what you learn in doing this is you don't like it and you can't do it, wow, what a valuable lesson you learn. You don't lose a lot of your hard-earned money trying it out. So try it out with one share for a while. See if it works for you. See how you handle losses. And don't allow yourself to get huge losses. You know, like in mine, it was 100000 and they couldn't get more than a $500 loss. And they had to... Um, this was on, I think they couldn't earn, they couldn't invest in more than $10,000 in, in any company. So anyway, and I, there's plenty of places on the, on the web where you can do this um, with software and try it out and try and try and teach yourself. But it's a, you know, I didn't do this today, but I will say this. My career has been running a research center on drug abuse. And I usually say to people, what is the relationship between drugs and drug abuse and the stock market? And the bottom line is they're both addictions. And so you can become really hooked on this. And so you've got to know yourself and you've got to be able to control yourself um, and control your losses, you know? And the other thing is that I'll just tell you that every student in my class learns is that, and one of the things they do in the, in the, in the um, virtual um, competition is I, I require them to invest $10,000 in the S&P 500, the SPY ETF. And I ask them to basically compare how the SPY did in their, in, their, in their seven weeks versus their individual stocks. And what I want them to know is that when it comes to having a a, a safe retirement and a left money in retirement that they should have, if they don't know how to do this, they should, even if they do know how to do this, they should have a good, a good amount of the money in something like 
the SPY, the S&P 500, because over your lifetime, barring something really strange happening, you're going to make money. And especially if you're young and you have 20, 30 years to go, you're going to do fine by having some of your money in the SPY because you don't want to have all of your money in the stock market where you could lose it and could, you know, hurt your future. So do we keep people or a lot of people leave? <laughs> They're still here. They're still here. All right. And uh, John, did you have any follow-up questions? No, I think it was great. I appreciate you coming on. We're honored to have you and show your respect. Um, you know, we we loved your presentation and Richard came from you, right? So He did. He did. <laughs> but he did it. I mean, I don't have a lot of other students who did what Richard did. He brought yeah. a lot to the table and he's continued it big time. I wish I were 50 years younger. Yeah. Don't you know, I wish. You know, <laughs> Me I could, too. To <laughs> do all of the IT and the YouTube and all that stuff. But um, Richard and I are talking about maybe doing either a longer interview or maybe some course like this at some point. I'd love to be able to to uh, make available to a larger population, um, you know, what we teach. I've get get emails from around the world for people saying, "Can I take your course?" And mm -hmm. unfor unfortunately, I haven't been able to offer that at the university that way. But I'm on a road to within the next two years to retire from the university and. Um, God willing, I hope I'll be able to um, to do something more to make this stuff available to people who find it valuable. People, as I say, if you find it valuable, what I what I shared today, great. If you didn't, I'm sorry that you wasted your time. <laughs>